Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, I'm taking some much-needed time off to denuke my brain in nature. So here's something I've wanted to compile for a while, a journalism special on how nuclear issues do and do not get covered. First, the epic fail of mainstream media's Fukushima coverage with Professor Celine Marie Pascal of American University in Washington, D.C. By the way, the epic fail is not her opinion. She's got data and footnotes to prove her point. Then we reprise a very special interview with multiple award-winning investigative reporter Susanna Frame of King 5 News in Seattle, the only broadcast journalist in the country assigned to a nuclear issue, in this case, Hanford. Then our eighth and final lesson on taking control of our own media, social media, with stalwart Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. Today is Tuesday. September 8th, 2015, and here is the Nuclear Hot Seat Journalism Special. When we focus on the media, three elements need to be considered. Where the media gets it wrong, where the media gets it right, and where we become our own media. Professor Celine Marie Pascal of American University in Washington, D.C., is a sociologist who did a study of mainstream media coverage in the first two years after Fukushima. And not only are her observations stunning, she's got the data to back them up. This interview was originally presented on Nuclear Hot Seat number 203 on May 2nd of 2015. Celine Marie Pascal, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start out with giving the listeners a sense of your background. I'm a sociologist at American University, and I'm interested in issues of language and knowledge. I study language use to understand the kinds of assumptions that people make in their daily lives that often reproduce systems of inequality. What first got you interested in studying media coverage that took place in the wake of the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster? I began noticing in my own casual reading that the media didn't cover the nuclear disaster in um, ways that I might have expected. And a little bit like what happened after Hurricane Katrina, that there was a way of reporting the natural disaster that really minimized what was going on and the social decisions that created the disaster itself around the levees. And so I wondered if something like that was happening with Fukushima, it seems like we weren't getting quite the whole story. From my perspective and that of people in the movement, we couldn't agree with you more. When did you start? turning this into research, and how did you proceed? Two years after the disaster, I began collecting newspaper articles, media coverage from the Huffington Post, Politico, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. I collected everything that they had printed about Fukushima in two years between the start of my data collection, which was the second year anniversary and the beginning of the disaster. What specifically were you looking for or looking at? As a sociologist, what I do is a systematic study to identify patterns. So I came into it thinking that it would be very interesting to look at how risk was constructed. How did these various media construct the notion of risk and how did it get particular kinds of meaning. And that began a really long coding process that um, I used Envigo, which is a systematic online way of looking for where the word risk might appear or associated words and that's going from there more deeply into the articles to understand how they were being used, what was the context of their use. 
So when you say you were looking for risk, you were actually searching for that word in the context of articles and news stories about Fukushima? Exactly. There is so much data here that what I wanted to focus on for the first article out of this data is just the construction of risk with regard to the general population. I was really surprised when I saw how rarely that was discussed in the media. So I think that out of almost 2,200 articles just about, that there were really only 129 across all of these media that talked about risk to populations at all. That's shocking. The rest of it was risk to economy, the risk to markets, risk to energy, but there were not really many articles at all that talked about the human aspect of this, except where workers were concerned. So it, it made it seem like if you were not a worker, you wouldn't be at high risk. And what was your understanding of the actual risk that the population faced as a result of this disaster? I'm not someone who studies nuclear energy, and I'm not an expert on radiation. So I'm coming at this in a very odd way. I understand that what happened at Fukushima was far more devastating than what happened at Chernobyl, but I don't have the expertise to say what the consequences of that would be. I can only tell you how media represent the potential consequences. So, for example, most of the articles that of that 129, 65 of them said, you know, the risk here is really low. You know, you are actually, and the New York Times ran an article saying, you're more at risk from radiation from rocks and cosmic rays from the environment than you are from anything happening at Fukushima. Well, I mean, that's pretty shocking. That's, that's the kind of reporting that was going on. Uh, the articles that said, well, you know, there's some slow risk here, but, you know, we can't really say that much about it. They compared the risk of cancer to walking through the x-ray machines at airports, right, that, that those were more dangerous than what was happening at Fukushima. One of the quotes that came from the article is that research shows that corporations and government agencies had disproportionate access to framing the event in the media. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I look across all of these articles, and I look at who's being quoted and in what context. So most of the time, you could find quotes from government officials, from various corporations, but what you really missed were quotes from people on the ground, from anti-nuclear groups, from organizations that are generally more critical of nuclear power. What do you think was behind this being the chosen narrative? Did it feel to you like it may have been a top-down decision, an edict from management or even higher government saying, play this down? Do you think it was ignorance on the part of the reporters to find contrasting views? Where do you think the failure to communicate more the seriousness of the risk came from? I couldn't say that there is a single point at work here. It certainly isn't a top-down. You know, in the U.S., we have a free media. You can report on whatever you want to report on. And yet, if you look at the dominant media outlets, they report the same stories in pretty much the same way every single day. You would think for that level of consistency that there was coercion somewhere. It doesn't work, that process in the U.S. doesn't work the same way that it might work in another country where there is literally a top-down coercive force. But rather, I think that it's a confluence of a lot of people who are involved in, who have access to the media, how we think about it. So of these 129 articles, only three of them were critical about this discourse of minimal risk. Three. So we have an original group of over 2,100 articles, 2,200 almost, and out of those, three are critical of how it's being reported. That's pretty shocking. That happens without someone coming through and saying, this is what you have to do, right? There's, there's a whole different process at work 
when corporate media, and here we have Huffington and Politico included in this, I was thinking that there might be something um, much more edgy, more, more confrontational there. Yeah, but no, that wasn't the case. We do know from certain private channels that certainly there was pressure put on the United States and the U.S. agreed to downplay the story. That came from a trade agreement that Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State signed approximately one month after the disaster began. I've also heard from private contact that there was pressure put certainly on national public radio, and I can't say the specifics on it, but certainly the will of the government was made known that it needed to be downplayed and that there were certain pressures put on that made it difficult for the reports to come out in, shall we say, a less biased and a more focused on risk kind of a way. In one instance, I know the news reporter for an NPR station who was specifically told not to use the word fallout in connection with Fukushima. The word can only be used in connection with the repercussions of a political mistake that got made, like somebody showing their private parts on a cell phone photo. For those of us who are following the issue very closely and following the day-by-day, almost minute-by-minute progression of Fukushima in those early days, what was remarkable is that for about three days, There were a lot of reports in the U.S. media talking about the plume of radiation from Fukushima coming towards the United States, the West Coast, and that it was going to hit in approximately eight days. For about three days, we heard that story, and then it vanished. It was nowhere. The word plume was not used, and there was no discussion of radiation hitting the West Coast even though we know from our own readings at the time that it did hit, and it was specifically very intense in the Seattle area where people were getting hot particles that were coming across from Fukushima. But it did not appear in the media after the third day. So it was suspected that something came down. We just haven't been able to nail with multiple sources so that it can be reported in a larger way what it was that actually happened. Um, I certainly found articles that reported that radiation from Fukushima was found in Vermont, articles that tracked that across the country. So I have a different experience. I'm not seeing that there's a blackout of news, but rather it's minimized. It's like no consequence. In a capitalist society where you don't have a police force. We're not controlled by military force. We're controlled by a certain kind of knowledge production. Uh, it began with the PR industry after World War I. It is through a construction of public knowledge that we have public order of a particular kind. And that's why I'm very interested in issues of knowledge production and power. In the articles that I've looked at, They're talking about, you know, these things happening, but they say it doesn't really matter. And one of the ways they say it doesn't matter is that, well, there's no real science. There's no hard science out there that will show us that this is going to have a negative effect. Well, science is always open to debate. It's not a science isn't necessarily a field where certainties rule, but the consequences of radiation poisoning are pretty well known. It's not that difficult, even though we don't have necessarily the specifics that map precisely onto Fukushima. I also found that there was languaging that was included in the minimization to subliminally direct people away from paying further attention. They would say that there was no immediate danger, that there was no significant exposure, with the words immediate and significant being key to this. And in truth about immediate, it takes so long for radiation exposure to manifest as some kind of an illness in the body that, in essence, they were literally correct, but they were giving a false impression that there was no danger. Yes. Did you find other languaging that was used consistently to turn people away from the disaster so that they weren't paying serious attention to it? 
Well, you as a reporter are able to infer a certain kind of intent, which I as a researcher can't do. So I'm not saying that they're reporting it this way in order to make people look another way. What I can tell you is that when you report on things in particular ways, it minimizes the interest, or it, but I can't really say what their intent was here. Does that distinction make sense? Yes, it does. We're coming at okay. it from two, from two particular perspectives on it, and that's just fine. The study goes on to point out how political disasters are and the efforts that go into controlling the narrative and the information the public receives. How do you see that continuing with the coverage of Fukushima? I think that the struggle for political power is present in the way that most everything gets reported. So one of the things that the literature on this shows us is that the more that we know about disasters, you would think we would take fewer risks, but instead we end up increasing the numbers of risks that we take. We put ourselves at greater danger because the scale of risk-taking is increasing in leaps and bounds. So in the short, what happens is experts seem to have supplied a kind of confidence to take bigger risks. So the dispersive production of risk in relationship to the general population relies on a kind of scientific uncertainty, and corporations and governments capitalized on this doubt about the presence of risk. And that results in a lot of ways to avoid responsibility. And, of course, it's easy to ignore radiation and its impact because it can't be perceived with any of the senses, and its impact takes place over time so that the distance between cause and effect is so great it can be denied. Exactly. It's very, very hard to track. And also there are specific forms of health problems. So if you're looking only at lung cancer, then it might not present very much of a risk. But if you think about diabetes, cataracts, heart problems that have come out of the studies from Chernobyl, then you're looking at something much more broad. And, of course, much more long-lasting because once the DNA is changed, once there's been genetic mutation, that's forever. Right. Right. So how has this study been disseminated, and has there been any effort to get it into the hands of decision-makers in the media? I presented a paper on this research in Yokohama, which is about 50 miles south of Fukushima. And the article that you've referenced was written about that conference presentation. I'm in the process now of finalizing an article. I've had requests from a couple of journals to publish it in different places. I haven't decided yet where to place it. And are any of these journals dealing with journalism, with the actual field of news coverage? No, they're not. But I work, I'm an affiliate with our School of Communication and talk frequently with faculty and students there about the production of knowledge in news reports. Just simple, how we pick language changes everything. Simple words make a huge difference. Yes, they do. In your work with the School of Communications, have you used Fukushima as an example yet in any of your presentations? This is a new research project for me. I have worked with them mostly on uh, representations of race in media. So if they or really anyone, I know our community would be very interested, would want to access the study, how might they go about doing so? Well, first I have to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> we were getting the jump on the gun on this one. You are. Because the article that you noticed came from a report on a conference presentation, not on a printed document, that's where we got into We're kind of in a circle yet. But it, it will come out soon. When you say soon, can you give me an approximate month on this? Yes, within the year. Interesting, because I'm a member of Sigma Delta Chi, the Professional Journalism Society, and every year they have a conference. This is an in-gathering of news directors, reporters, cable, broadcast, satellite, 
for all of the United States and Canada, and usually it works at the same time with the Spanish language stations as well, the joint conference that gets held. And there are more than 1,000 media decision makers and on-the-ground reporters who are there every year. I attended two years ago. I'm hoping to be able to attend this fall again on behalf of this movement. It would be fascinating if your work could be brought to their attention in advance so that perhaps it would be a topic of conversation. That would be very interesting. What I'm finding in the media here is no different from what I found when I did media studies of reporting on homelessness, that the same sets of principles are at work. In what way? When articles about people who can't afford housing talked about, uh, well, they very rarely talked about people who can't afford housing. They talked about homeless or the homeless. They used a certain kind of language that became part of a discourse that removed people from the reality of the experience. And very, very rarely did they ever interview people who actually were unable to afford housing. Instead, they interviewed people who had housing about how they felt about people who don't have housing. That's a very peculiar way to report on a topic, and yet that is a standard reporting practice in the U.S. And how did that play out in the coverage of Fukushima? In Fukushima, I haven't finished my data analysis to say with definitiveness, but what I'm seeing is that there is a kind of group think in how all of these things are reported. So you had asked about articles that were critical, and there was one in the New York Times, one in the Huffington Post, and one in the Washington Post. So it's not like there's one media outlet that's charging ahead, but that there's a little piece in all of them. It's just that the massive amount of reporting is following the party line, so to speak. It would just be so fascinating if you could get something published and available. It's mid-September in Orlando if you can get yourself down there, or if not, at least make it available. Have there been any reporters or news directors or members of the mainstream media who have gotten back to you even after this small article appeared? Well, I've gotten a lot of feedback from bloggers and other scholars, but no, not from mainstream media. It's going to be interesting to see whether any kind of noise can be made around your study. It's certainly going to be picked up by our side of the hill. It would be good to see if there's any kind of way to get it into the hands and the mind of those who are in charge of mainstream media to see if we can get better coverage because next year is the fifth anniversary. As you're probably aware, the media likes things that happen one year after and then it's in multiples of five. <laughs> and that's so logical. Let's not cover for the years in between. Let's just go in five years. At five right. Years. So right. We've, we've got a real shot here. Do you have any thoughts to share that perhaps we have not gotten to? The single takeaway point for me is that all knowledge, it's, it's a social process, right? And it's expressive of value judgments, of politics. There's a lot of contradiction in it. And that we have to look at all reporting as a, a construction of events. There is no such thing as news. We create news. And how we create that news, how we give events particular presence and meaning in our lives is always a political struggle for power. That's my takeaway. Beautifully done. Celine Marie Pascal, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Celine Marie Pascal, professor of sociology at American University in Washington, D.C. We'll have our interview with King 5's Susanna Frame in just a moment. But first, the Nuclear Hot Seat website is still in the process of rising from the digital ashes after its takedown over a month ago. Technical things, alas, do not go as quickly as one would hope, especially when it comes to recoding and uploading over 200 audios with support materials. Work like this does not come cheaply. 
And I want to thank those of you who have already donated to the Let's Fix the Nuclear Hot Seat website campaign. The good news is that we have raised just over three-quarters of the funds necessary to pay for our improved, more functional, nuclear containment vessel strength protected website and its four-year archive. The bad news? We're still a quarter of the way short. For now, we do have an emergency landing page at NuclearHotSeat.com, which is secure. You can access download links to the last few weeks of the show, as well as a repeat secure link to make a donation, either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. At this point, all we need is about $400, and we're in the clear. So if you have ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, please don't wait. Don't wait for the end of the year. Don't wait for tax season. You can wait till my birthday, but that's just the end of this month. Now is the perfect time. Any amount is appreciated, and no amount is insignificant, because it shows me that you care about the show and that it continues. That helps it keep going. That helps me keep going. And I thank you for the kind notes and words that I've gotten along the way to raise these funds. So please... Do not wait. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com to find the secure donate link. And if you prefer not to donate online, you can email me for a snail mail address to send your donation. Know that I am deeply touched by your generosity, by your comments, by your willingness to care and to stay tuned to this show. So whatever you can do to help, thank you. Next is one of my favorite nuclear hot seat interviews of all time. Susanna Frame is an award-winning investigative journalist with King 5 News, the NBC TV affiliate in Seattle. We spoke for nuclear hot seat number 107 on July 16 of 2013, more than two years ago. Give a listen to what a real broadcast journalist sounds like, what she deals with, and the unlikely way the crucial Hanford nuclear story came to be the focus of her powerhouse reports. Susanna Frame, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Uh, thanks for having me. You've been with King 5 in Seattle for more than two decades, and this is a broadcast television station. When did they first start covering the Hanford site, and how did you become involved in the coverage? Well, I'm assuming that years before I got here, they were covering... Hanford in terms of, you know, on an environmental beat. The Pacific Northwest is all about the outdoors and the environment. And we've always had an environmental specialist, and we still do. And so occasionally when there would be, you know, milestones hit at Hanford or new technology developed, an environmental specialist would go over and cover it. But this is the first time that I know of that someone in an investigative capacity has gone over and decided to shake things up. In the time that I've been there, I, I, I think I'm the first investigative reporter to try to take on uh, portions of Hanford. And are you referring to yourself as the first investigative reporter for King 5 or in general in Washington State? In the time I've been here, I haven't seen any broadcast investigative units doing anything. Maybe the Seattle Times has done a little bit, but in general, it's kind of been ignored in terms of investigative reporting, which, you know, as you know, is different than daily news reporting. In putting together the sources that you need to get the stories that you're doing, is this from inside the facility? Is this written material that is on file with the government? Is it whistleblowers? How are you getting your information? The only reason I got involved was one guy, and his name is Mike Guthrie, and he's not a confidential source. Obviously, I just you know, said his name. He's been on the air with us. He is a current employee. He's been there 26 years. What I like to do is choose one topic a year to really get into and try to make an impact. And this year, it you know, unbeknownst to me, before uh, the beginning of March, my project this year was going to be hampered. But this is a true story. On February 28th, last day of February, our investigative unit, of which there's five of us in our unit, three reporters, 
producer and a photographer. We had a meeting, and it was like a store pitch meeting, and we had a new boss, a new producer, and he was just like saying, you know, what do you think is, is important community topics that we should be covering, you know, kind of think about as we move forward into the spring. And we were talking about Sandy Hook and gun control and mental illness and all, all sorts of different community issues. And then I said, you know, gosh, there's got to be something we can start uncovering in Hanford. I go, I think that's the biggest story around. And the reason I mentioned it is because our governor, Jay Inslee, newly elected, had just been to Hanford, taken a big, well-publicized tour of it, and made an announcement with the Department of Energy, which the federal government agency that runs Hanford, that some of our single-shell underground nuclear waste tanks were leaking. So it had been on the front page of the papers. Our environmental specialists had been covering it, and it was like, that is bad. And I really didn't know much about Hanford at all, at all. I just said, I just really think we got to do something. And so there was one uh, reporter in our unit that really didn't have a project, and so we left the meeting, a big project he was focusing on. We left the meeting, and he said, okay, I'm going to figure out something and see what we can do on Hanford. The next day, I got a direct message on Facebook out of the blue from someone I've known for 30 years. It said, hey, Susanna, do you want to know the real scoop about Hanford? Give me a ring, Mike. And then he left his phone number. And I happened to check my direct messages that day, and I called him, or I, I messaged him back right away, and I said, of course I want to know what's going on at Hanford. Were you in a room? You know, were you listening? And, so this, is, this uh, is just serendipity that happened. It kind of yeah, fell into yeah. your lap at the right time. Yes. This is weird things that have happened in my career, just like this. So then we started talking on the phone, and I've known him for 30 years because I went to high school with him. My husband went to junior high with him, and I didn't even know he worked at Hanford. So I hadn't seen him in that long. So we started talking on the phone. He was telling me uh, specific things that he had encountered working at Hanford. Most recently, that he was the one that discovered that the first double-shell nuclear waste tank was leaking at Hanford, and that his company had ignored the leak for a year. His, he works for a U.S. government contractor. That's the Washington and, River Project solution. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called protection Washington solution. River. Yeah, protection solution doesn't really roll at the time, so we just call it WRPS or work. So um, it sounded very interesting to me. So I got in my car and on my day off on Sunday, I drove to where he lives, which is Yakima, Washington, which is where I grew up. That's about two and a half hours away from Seattle, and I met with him at a restaurant, and I left five hours later with a huge pile of notes and a big notebook that he had given me. And by the time I'd driven back that night on Sunday, I had like eight stories in my head just to, to begin with that I thought we could do. So that's how I got interested. That was, I'd say, March 10th. So literally before the beginning of March, I didn't know really anything about Hanford. But I've been studying it and breaking stories and, and producing stories in a rolling investigation ever, ever since then. How has the support been within Team 5 to this series of reports? Oh, awesome, awesome. We have the most amazing news director and general manager, and he is the type of leader who just he just trusts our unit. If we think it's a story, then he trusts us and believes us and in us and lets us do what we need to do. Now, of course, you have to deliver. And burn the goods and have them, you know, and be producing stories and put them on TV and online. But uh, I think we're really lucky in that capacity in that our company, BLO, uh, is very supportive of investigative journalism and definitely our management is. So any travel I need to do, he says yes. Hanford is a long way from here. It's in eastern Washington and it takes almost four hours to get there. So it's not like I can just get up and run over there and do a quick interview. So we've mm -hmm. been over there a lot, and, you know, it's been an investment. You know, we've, we've had our helicopter flying over there, getting lots of shots. We've stayed in lots of hotel rooms. We've traveled on the East Coast to consult with the best experts in the nuclear field. So, you know, I, my hat is off to my station for that kind of support. So that's what it takes. That's actually what got the two of us in contact with each other, because within the nuclear movement, we, of course, watch mainstream media praying for something, anything to be covered. And the one place with consistent coverage of a nearby nuclear problem was King 5 News in Seattle and you. So that was my outreach just to commend you, and that's what started this connection. I'm wondering, one of the problems that emerged at the site is that it's been known since sometime last year, I think it was October, correct me if I'm wrong on that, 
But it's been known that this double-sided tank was actually leaking into the environment, but WRPS chose not to do anything about it or tried to cover it up. To what extent were you involved with breaking that aspect of the story? Well, no one knew about that aspect of the story until we did the story. Yeah, we, we did break that story. Um, Washington State Department of Ecology didn't know about it. Many people within WERPS themselves, I, I don't think really anybody at WRPS knew. I don't think the Department of Energy knew, the U.S. government. So we were the ones that, that let, you know, basically the world know that this company knew or should have known in October of 2011 that for the first time ever, a double-shell nuclear waste tank was leaking the most dangerous material in the world into what's called the annulus. So that's the hollow space, the safety space, between the inner and the outer shell. So you can say, ah, big deal. It's safely held in that safety space. That's why it has a double shell. But unfortunately, I broke the story then just last month in June that it's now leaking into the soil. So to have proceeded as they did, which was to basically ignore the leak, to talk themselves out of it being a leak, coming up with all sorts of different theories about what was really going on except for the truth, which was nuclear waste was leaking, you know, that, that was irresponsible. And we, when I found out about it through this contact I told you about, you know, I knew I had to get the documentation to back it up because it's a very serious allegation to make. And I think we did. You know, everything that we reported is based in records that I obtained either seriously on the Internet. There was a huge report that was written but was totally buried, a 500-page report, written by WRPS. And 496 pages of it was glossed over, you know, making excuses and so forth mm-hmm. for the truth. But there was about four or five pages in there where they incriminated themselves. And few people read an assessment report top to bottom unless you're paid to do so like me. And the people who generate those reports count on it. Oh, yeah. I mean, the executive summary, if you were to read the executive summary, two pages. Ta-da! In October of 2012, we found out it was leaking. And aren't we shocked? And we're going to make an announcement to the world, and we all covered it that time. And I came around in 2013 and said, "Uh uh-uh. It was leaking well before that. And your contractor did nothing, sat on it, made excuses, called it rainwater, as one red flag after another rolled in that it was leaking nuclear waste. And we pointed that out in many different reports and covered it from several different angles and tried to expose something new in every report. I mean, I think we've done about 10 so far. We've been covering it. You get picked up by a service called enenews.com which is a news aggregator on all things that are pertinent to the anti-nuclear stance on the nuclear movement. And it, regularly, your reports are linked to and promoted, and from there it goes out to the entire community that's working on these issues internationally. Oh, good. That's good. What has been the official response to this information that has been broken to the public because of your coverage? Well, I'm in constant communication with the public information officials at WRPS and with the U.S. Department of Energy and with the Washington State Department of Ecology. And I have a very, very open approach to my reporting. Nothing I've reported is a surprise to them because I tell them ahead of time what I'm going to say. How far ahead of time? Usually... A week. It depends on, you know, how far out. You know, once I got the investigation rolling, then I was doing about one story a week and producing as I went along. So the minute I knew what my new story would be, I would email them, call them, tell them, and give them an opportunity to respond. And I kept very good records of all this, and I even put them online. All of my communications with these different officials, begging them to participate in the story, to to go on camera, and they all refused except for eventually the Washington State Department of Ecology did go on camera. But anyway, their response has been basically nothing. They've never corrected me. They've never called me to challenge me. 
at the beginning, especially WRPS officials were extremely condescending. They tried to bully me. They tried to tell me that basically I was an idiot, but I didn't know what I was doing. I've never had media professionals uh, deal with me in that way. Cause, I mean, I've been around for a long time, and, I mean, not... And you have, an extra- you have an extraordinary resume and an extraordinary career filled with acknowledgement of the excellence of the reporting that you well, have done. thank you. But, you know, it's not like I just showed up and, you know, fell off the cart and, and oh, maybe I'm going to do a story on this. I mean, I'd researched it thoroughly, and we don't put anything on TV that is innuendo, rumor. That's just not the way it works. I mean, there's too much liability. It's too important, and truth and accuracy and context is what my unit is about. But when I presented them with, you know, my initial evidence and what I told them what I was going to do and that I was planning on doing a multi-part series, I think they were just so shocked because they didn't know anything about it. If they did know about it, they faked it really well. But they were uh, – I, I was really surprised at the way I was treated. They just said, do you even know how to Google? I mean, clearly, you, you, you've you never Googled radiology, uh, radiation because you don't know anything about radiation. And I tried to say, well, you know, I've gone all over the country and interviewed experts. Well, who are your experts? And I would tell them, well, who's Arjun Makajani? And I said, well, he's one of the top nuclear physicists in the world. And I went to Virginia to interview him. Huh, have you ever worked at a tank farm? I mean, that's the way they were tra- talking to me. So mm-hmm. they really tried to beat me, browbeat me into not doing the story at all. They said, we think you will be publicly humiliated if you go on TV and online and report this, because what you're saying is so absurd, Savannah. You're saying we ignored a leak that's completely false. We did everything we could, blah, 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 blah. I can't believe you're planning on doing one story, let alone ten. So I was super upfront with them, and I just had to press on. You know, I can't let that kind of browbeating and bullying behavior keep me from pursuing the truth. So we went ahead, and they've never come out and said, hey, you know, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I think that's what they should say. Thank you. Now we can maybe do it better next time because this isn't the only double shell tank. There's 27 others. And because of our reporting, for example, they don't know that, I mean, I have to find this out through my sources, but they immediately put together a safety committee within WRPS so that they could put together badly needed and missing alarm response plans. And that was one of my stories, is that when the alarm sounded that this waste was leaking in October, October 9th of 2011, they didn't have a plan in place on what to do. In fact, I have a logbook from the shift manager page of the law book, log book, it says, in midnight on October 9, 2011, cannot find alarm response procedure. Basically, the poor guy didn't know what to do. And they fumbled around for a year until they couldn't ignore it anymore. And WRPS told me they did have what's called an ARP, alarm response procedure. They had one. They always have had one. And I said, no, you don't. You don't. Show it to me. And, you know, they tried to fudge around with this procedure and that and that. I said, no, none of those are alarm response procedures. And if you would have had one, you would have had to follow it, and you probably would have found this leak a year before. So officially they were telling me, oh, we we have a plan. But actually we didn't even need a plan because we had all these other procedures. But behind the scenes, after my story aired, they formed a committee. They put the whistleblower that we interviewed on the committee. And they're putting together those procedures now. So this isn't going to happen again. The next time, I'm, I hope it doesn't happen again, but if it does happen again, if, if the leak detection alarm goes off, I think they'll know what to do. So personally, I think they should say, hey, thanks, King 5. We're going to make this better for our community. And I would not, hold, I would not hold my breath waiting for that. No, kind of I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. <laughs> and the Department of Energy really hasn't responded much to me. I mean, you can see in my stories they're running away from me in a parking lot. When I tried to interview them, that was embarrassing for them. And uh, the Department of Ecology has come out and thanked us publicly. You know, the governor's representative is the director of ecology. Her name is Maya Bellin. Uh, I did one little story with her. And they are very frustrated because they found out a lot about that tank and about a lot of the issues surrounding the leak from watching TV. And, you know, they are... It's not the way it should happen because they should be getting the straight information. I mean, you are a... This is an example 
of why we need a free and independent press the overall term, be it broadcasting or in print, but why we need a free and independent press in this country to hold corporations and governments and businesses up to the highest possible standards because obviously the lies are going on and until they're called in a public way that embarrasses them enough or threatens them with lawsuits enough, they're not going to come forward and cop to what it is they're actually doing or not doing. I'm sure they do a lot of really good things there. I know they've hit a lot of milestones. I know they've done good work. I think they've done a lot of good stuff with groundwater treatment and protecting the Columbia River, which, you know, Hanford is right on the banks of the Columbia River. But that's the story they want to tell. Those are the only stories they want to tell. And when something goes badly, that is when it's time to hunker down, circle the wagons, and, you know, try to get someone like me off of the topic. And typically what happens is this stuff comes out from whistleblowers, and they are punished. They're systematically, typically not just from WRPS, but from all the different contractors. It happens at every level of the nuclear industry. We have many stories of that coming out from San Onofre here in Southern California. Right. But it's not happening this time. It oh, is really? not happening. No, absolutely not. Mike Geffrey, our main whistleblower. Now, since then, I've developed many other sources. But they're all confidential. No one wants else wants this. That took a lot of courage for him to go on camera, you know, more than once with us. And I think it's because of the way he did come out with his story. He came out with his story on TV. And I think in a weird way that provided him more protection. A, he's right, which, you know, the truth is always good to have on your side. And he's so credible, and he's such a great employee. He's not a troublemaker. He's one employee of the year, employee of the month. So, you know, contractors change. He's worked for, like, six different contractors because the low-bid company will get the contract. So this is his fifth or sixth contractor he's worked for. And the first four or five treated him really well. And this is the first one that they just didn't want to hear what he had to say when he found this leak. But anyway, I think because... His story came out publicly like that. They really couldn't do anything to him because the next story was going to be that he got fired. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I I don't know. It's it's been very interesting. He likes his job better than ever. He feels like a huge burden was lifted because he carried this around for a year and didn't know what to do. He knew what was at risk. He was so frustrated. And my second story in the series focuses a lot on what he went through personally and almost quit his, his job and his really great career because he was trying to do the right thing and they just were telling him to shut up. And so when he didn't get any action and he didn't trust the system, he reached out to me on Facebook. Amazing. We did do an interview on Nuclear Hot Seat a few weeks ago with some of the activists who are involved in Hanford. Have you been in contact at all with Washington State Positions for Social Responsibility or have they contacted you? I've met uh, one of their representatives at a nuclear, kind of an open house event at the University of Washington. So I met I met one of their representatives there, and I've seen some of their other members at Hanford Advisory Board meeting. You know, they've emailed me, but I know I haven't had them a part of my story yet. I, I mean, I think they'd be great, and we're not done, and so I hope that we will be working with them in the future. The watchdog organizations that, I've reached out to for basically just for response is and for challenge, Heart of American Northwest, and also Columbia Riverkeeper. Now they're based in in Oregon, and those other two are based here in Seattle. What advice would you want to give anti-nuclear activists who are concerned with the Hanford issue and elsewhere? This could extrapolate out. But what advice would you give them for improving their communication with you and their dealings to make it easier for them to at least be in the queue to have a voice on the issues? Well, it's very easy to find me. Anybody can email me, sframe at king5.com, or if you just go to the King5 website, my contact information is there. And I welcome all voices. You know, I've worked really hard to try to get different people involved and on camera, and I can tell you it is not easy. We want different voices and we want diversity from the community, but I just can't tell you how hard it's been to get people to want to step up because let's say you're a scientist 
you know, the word is with the government. And there's a whole culture up here of just not saying anything negative about Hanford. I truly had no idea this was so new for you. I just assumed you'd been covering Hanford for the last 20 years. No, 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 no. I've never even done an environmental story before as an investigative report. <laughs> you sure hit the ground running, <laughs> doing an extraordinary job, because truly there's no other reporter in the country who's been given this freedom, certainly in broadcast, to be able to get a local nuclear-related story out with this much consistency and with an investigative bent to it as opposed to just taking the talking points that they get from the press releases. So I'm so grateful to Mike Geffrey and his courage to come forward. I want to shift this slightly. Until recently, King 5 was owned by BELO, the broadcast organization you talked about, which was on the small side regional player with 20 commercial broadcast TV stations and two regional 24-hour cable news TV stations. But just last month, in June, BELO was purchased by Gannett, or at least Gannett announced that they were planning to buy BELO which will then make Gannett the fourth largest broadcast organization in the country. In other words, it may not be an 800-pound gorilla, but it's a 700-pound gorilla. Mm -hmm. How do you think this change of ownership will impact the kind of reporting that you've been empowered to do? I don't think it's going to change at all. Gannett has a great track record. And the person that is at the top of the heap at Gannett over news is one of my former news directors. And I have all the confidence in the world that he has the same value system that we do. His name is Dave Luigi. He's a great journalist, a very smart person, and I haven't worried one minute about that. I think it's going to be fine. What has impacted you most personally about what you've been learning? I always say this when I, every time I go to the Tri-Cities and I see new buildings going up and more condos and more restaurants coming in, I go, that is a sign of hopelessness. I don't think it's hopeless. I would never, I, I'm not that type of person. I'm very positive, even though, you know, the kind of things I report on are never happy to lucky. But I am a positive person. But it's just sad to me, the wasted opportunities over there and just the machine, how the money just keeps coming in and keeps coming in. And they've just hit so many stacks in the last couple of years that I just feel like, especially coming from that part of the country, you know, I'm from eastern Washington, I don't think it's not going to be my kids. I think it's going to be my grandkids and my great-great-grandkids or one other generation still dealing with it. it is, it's really, that's been sad to me, is to think about how long it's taken, how Every single projection, every promise the federal government has made to us, they've blown, whether that be environmentally or financially. Again, of course they've done some really good things, but there's 56 million gallons of nuclear sludge in those underground tanks. Those tanks were never built to last this long. They're breaking down. The stuff's getting into the soil, and everything rolls downhill, you know, Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, if they don't figure it out, it's going to end up in the Columbia River. Is there some thought or belief or concept or anything at all that you would like to say that perhaps we haven't covered yet? I think for real change to happen over there, I really think Congress has to get more involved. I think that the Northwest is lucky in that Senator from Oregon, Ron Wyden. Ron Wyden, yes. Is yeah, and he has the highest position in the Senate on nuclear issues with Energy Committee. So I think that's good, but I think more has to be done. I think on the congressional level, and if, if the public wants to have a voice and want to see something positive change, I really think Congress has to be pushed to get third party there to oversee the site. I think that's what it's going to take. A new set of eyes over there. I would like to see, and I put it on myself, too, to make my reporting compelling enough that Congress will get involved. I've been in touch with our senators. They really haven't seen that interested yet, and that's been a source of disappointment for us. You know, I think they're in contact behind the scenes, but they haven't. You'll see, they, they don't show up in any of my stories yet, and I've been on them. So that is one of my goals, is to see Congress get involved and do something positive. I can think of no one better to push that agenda forward than you. <laughs>
Susanna Frame of King 5 News in Seattle. Since we spoke, her reports on the Hanford site have, in 2013 and 2014, won her a Peabody Award, three Edward R. Murrell Awards, a National Headliners Award, and twice being cited by Investigative Reporters and Editors, Inc., as a finalist as one of the most outstanding examples of watchdog journalism in the country. Now for ways to create our own media, here's Dave Parrish of OperationSaveTheEarth.com with the last in our series of social media super tricks for activists. Number eight, as Stephen Sondheim would say, putting it together. Hey guys, it's Dave from Operation Save the Earth, and I'm here with the final installment of our eight-part social media super trick series. I've had a blast putting these together for you, and I want to give a big thanks to Levy Halevi for coming up with the idea in the first place. If it's one thing I hope you got out of this series is that over the past 20 years, social media on the web has evolved at an astonishing rate. Last year's MySpace is this year's Facebook and next year's Snapchat and beyond. And in five years, the rules and preferred spaces could be totally different from now. As the web evolves, you need to evolve with it. All the super tricks will help you get started. Daily content production is a great way to continue your evolutionary process. And in order to stay current and topical, you also need to know your keywords and where to put them. You need to like, share, and comment on Facebook, even though your reach may be limited there, unless you pay them. What works best is when you plug that platform and many others into your Twitter account, the current game changer in social media trending. Pretty pictures make the web go round, but it's video on YouTube, the power blog that can really make waves for you. And Google+, Plus, the not-so-secret weapon we need to rewrite the algorithms, feed the SEO spiders, and eventually win the day. Regardless of how you want to provide your content, whether it's just a share on Pinterest or a full-blown website, your final super trick of the series is this. Know your audience and bring laser focus in your message to them. When your target audience is everyone, but nobody wants to hear it, and your message is scattered, how much efficacy do you think you'll achieve? As the clock continues to run and the Fukushima nightmare worsens, it's critical for you to address this for yourself. Just understand that our message is true. Our team worldwide is strong. And if you always come from the heart, people will listen and start to understand. This program you're listening to is an excellent example of that. Thanks again to Nuclear Hot Seat, and if you want to find out more about the four-step plan known as Operation Save the Earth, just go to www.operationsavetheearth.com. Check out our comprehensive link section, watch a video, or maybe get inspired to do your own thing. Our sister Megan Rice tells us that we need to utilize our own individual talents to stop this nightmare from happening. So now, it's up to you. Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth, thank you for this eight-part summer series on social media super tricks for activists. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 8, 2015. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on iTunes under Podcasts. Our archive is currently available on YouTube under Nuclear Hot Seat videos, thanks to Joni Ray and the help she receives from Ms. Milky the Clown, and also on iTunes under podcasts. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating.